Hey y'all, included in with the epithelial tissue section of the histology unit is the notes on glands and what glands are and the differences between endocrine glands and exocrine glands. But before we can look at those differences, we need to talk about what a gland is and what kind of tissue makes up a gland. If you remember back to simple cuboidal tissue made up of simple cuboidal cells, the property of those individual cells were secretion and absorption. And if you put groups of those cells together, you can create something called a gland. And a gland is going to make something for the body, whether that is um, a hormone or whether that is sweat or whether that is oil. Anything that is made um, in the body by a gland is going to be called a secretion. And there are two types of glands uh, that we're going to look at. And the first distinction for those glands is where do they release their product? Do they release it directly into the bloodstream? Um, then it is called an endocrine gland. Or do, do they excrete it out or secrete it out, I should say, um, onto some kind of surface, like the surface of your body, the surface of the inside of your mouth, like a salivary gland? the surface of your face, like an oil gland. If that's the case, um, then it is an exocrine gland versus an endocrine gland, which is internally secreting the product into the bloodstream. Another way to distinguish glands is by how many cells make up the gland. Most of them are multicellular. They require more than one cell to make up the gland. Others are just unicellular glands, and most of those are going to be um, kind of scattered within the simple columnar tissue or scattered within the pseudostratified and are normally uh, composed of mucus or they're a goblet cell which has the mucus droplet within it. All right, let's look at the notes. Um, we're going to go down the endocrine column first. An endocrine gland is going to secrete into the bloodstream, directly into a capillary, and those glands are called a ductless glands. Um, and ductless means that instead of it having, having this emptying tube, the gland is going to be wrapped in capillaries and wrapped in blood vessels instead of it having this canal or tube that it empties out onto a surface. The examples of endocrine glands in your body are here, and those include your pituitary gland, thyroid gland, adrenal gland, which sits on top of the kidney, a testis in a male, ovary in a female, pancreas, um, and pineal gland up in the, your brain. I don't know if I said thymus, but it also includes the thymus. So any of these glands are going to make hormones, and hormones have very widespread effects in the body. If that hormone or if that secretion has access to the bloodstream, then it can go anywhere in the body. As compared to an exocrine gland, if an exocrine gland secretes into a duct or secretes into some kind of space, then it doesn't have access to the entire body. It only has localized effects. Okay, so what we're going to do here is look that on your bottom of your sheet, you have two boxes. Um, and just a reminder that endocrine glands will secrete directly into the bloodstream and they make hormones or secrete hormones, which have widespread effects. All right, now we'll go down the exocrine side. Okay, and the first thing we're going to do is look at exocrine glands and how they are separated based on number of cells. If an exocrine gland is unicellular, it is just one cell that kind of hangs out or is mixed in with some of the other epithelial tissue. Two examples of unicellular exocrine glands are mucus cells and goblet cells. And we've already looked at goblet cells when we did simple columnar and pseudostratified columnar epithelia. Both of these cells are going to produce mucus, and the way that they secrete, or the way that they spit out that mucus, for a better term, uh, is by exocytosis. And if we split up that word, exo means out, cyte means cell, osis means condition. So it's literally the condition 
of that mucus moving to the apical side of that cell and just kind of pushing it out into the lumen or into the duct. When we looked at simple cuboidal tissue, it always had that ring of simple cuboidal cells, and in the middle of that ring was a space. That space is called a lumen, and all of those lumens kind of meet up together into something called a duct. And a duct is, is very similar to a lumen. It's the space or the way in which the gland will empty its secretion. Multicellular glands are going to be composed of more than one cell, and they are going to secrete into a duct, which is going to open up onto a surface. Again, that surface can be anywhere across the body. It can be oil glands that are secreting on the surface of your scalp, on your face, on your body. It could be a salivary gland opening to the surface of your mouth. It can also be um, secreting to the inside of an organ. So anytime there is a surface, the duct is going to empty out onto that. Because they don't have access to the bloodstream, they're going to only have very localized effects. Okay, think about saliva. It's just going to go to the opening of that gland, and that's really all the only place that it can go, um, versus the endocrine glands can put their secretion or their hormone into the bloodstream, and that serves as a highway for that hormone to move throughout the body. Um, multicellular glands do have different shapes. Uh, a tubular run that looks kind of like a straw. Alveolar is going to look like a cluster of grapes. Acener is also going to be similar to a cluster of grapes, but they don't always have to be just a U-shape. Sometimes that U-shape can branch and branch and branch and look more like a, a, a tree branch or a cluster of grapes. The way that we're going to split up exocrine multicellular glands is the way in which they secrete, the way in which they push out or spit out their secretion into the space or into the lumen or into the duct. And so let's look at the first one. Um, the first one we're going to do is merocrine. Okay, and merocrine glands look like this. And you'll have to take some time to draw this in your notes. But merocrine glands are composed of simple cuboidal cells. And I see those simple cuboidal cells here, roughly cube shape. The purple here is the nucleus. The red is your secretory product. Your example of merocrine glands are saliva glands or salivary glands and sweat glands. So this secretory product or this secretion that is made by the gland would be saliva or sweat. And what will happen is this saliva and sweat will accumulate here at the edge or the apical portion of the epithelial cell and it will be or secreted, I should say, secreted into this duct, which is the space, by exocytosis. So the cell just spits it out. It reaches the edge. Here's a little vesicle. It fuses with that cell membrane, and then the cell releases it into the duct. The second type of exocrine gland is an apocrine gland. And the difference here is, is really just the way that the secretion happens. So instead of the cell just spitting out the secretory product or releasing the saliva or sweat into the, the duct, now there's going to be a little pinched off portion, a little cell packet um, that gets ripped off of the apical portion of the cell, and then that is moved through the duct and out onto the surface of the body. The only example that we have right now for apocrine, exocrine glands in the body is mammary glands, and so the secretion would be breast milk. So just a little bit different, instead of it just being the secretory product, now that secretory product is wrapped in a little bit of uh, a cell membrane or a cell packet. Notice that there is not a nucleus in the secretion. The next type, there will be a nucleus. So the way to differentiate between apocrine and holocrine is to look inside the uh, duct and see, well, this is just the secretory product. This is just the secretion, so it has to be apocrine. As compared to holocrine, when we look at holocrine glands, the whole cell gets secreted. So this um, simple cuboidal cell is undergoing mitosis. And when it makes a new cell, it pushes the old one into the center of the duct. Once it gets into the duct, it will disintegrate and release all of its contents. Um, so I think holocrine releases the whole cell. And I know it's the whole cell because I see the nucleus plus the secretory product within that cell. 
plus I can see that these cells are undergoing mitosis and that old cell just gets pushed over into the duct because we need to freshen it up. Now, the only example right now for us for a holocrine gland is a sebaceous gland, and sebaceous glands make sebum, and that is oil for the body. So it is a nice lubricant for the body, and it's going to prevent desiccation or drying out of the skin. Sebaceous glands are everywhere across the body. They're a little more concentrated on the face, which is why you get oily face, you get acne, you know, all of that comes from these sebaceous glands. But again, what happens is we push the cell in, once it gets inside, that cell disintegrates, and then it becomes oil on the surface of our bodies. And that's really it. So it's pretty simple. The way that you need to think about this is just to go back to your flow chart and split it up based on endocrine and exocrine first. Then within the exocrine side, you need to split it up between unicellular and multicellular. That would be a structural differentiation because that's what it looks like. Is it one cell or more than one cell? And then within the multicellular exocrine glands, you have three examples, merocrine, apocrine, and holocrine. So you need to know not only how does it make its secretion, but what are the examples in the body? I think that's it.